Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Clem and these are resin prints. And as you all know, you have to cure them before you can actively use these prints for practical purposes. But usually you just blast them with UV rays and hope for the best. Not today, we're going to do the scientific approach. So all the 3D printing resins work basically the same. Inside the resin is a substance called a photoinitiator. When that gets hit by UV rays, it basically deteriorates, sets free other chemicals, those react with the resin, and then they harden. And these photoinitiators are specifically made to work with a specific wavelength of UV light. They can also work with daylight, for daylight resins specifically and these are usually tuned to the machine. In most cheaper resins, you basically have a broad spectrum of UV light that can activate it, which also explains why if you pour it out then in your room or in the sun, then they instantly cure. And more specific resins usually have a more narrow range of UV light that they react to, because they are made for specific special purposes or for special machines. We want to explore which spectrum exactly is it for each resin that makes it cure, which ones uh, activate curing indicators, so we have an educated guess about how to best cure a part. As you may know, I'm now a resin producer myself, and I like to do the scientific approach. So I think there is an optimal way for every material to be cured. Because worst case, what could happen if you do it the wrong way? Let's say you pump as much energy as you can inside the part via UV light. Worst case, there's a heat buildup, there is a tension buildup inside the part, and it could crack during curing or shortly afterwards. This happens especially with very brittle high detail resins, but I think it could happen with pretty much any material if you cure it the wrong way. And I want to find out, is there a perfect way to cure every material and to make basically profiles for curing, so a very advanced curing station. First, we have to make scientific equipment to find that out, and that is today's project. Big thanks to the wonderful people at Wirt Electronic who sent me the newest range of their UV LEDs. Usually, if you buy UV LEDs, they're mostly like broad spectrum. And if you get into the real expensive stuff, then you get narrow spectrum, where it's like exactly that amount of nanometers. Like if you want to have a 405 nanometer LED and you buy the cheap ones, you get something that has like a broad spectrum and a peak at 405. But what we want is, I want exactly 405 or as exact as you can get. And exactly 395 and 370 and 385. And Wirt now has a range of UV LEDs that has that narrow peak point, so I know exactly which spectrum they are active and they don't break the bank. And they have like accompanying high precision LED drivers, so I'm gonna use them both. Let's start by designing something up in CalCAD. Welcome to my computer and KiCad. This is the circuit for the LED portion of my device. So these LEDs represent the UV LEDs that I got from Word. So I'm making modules. This whole schematic is one module and each of these modules will get a different type of LED. I will have two of these LED drivers on there. One of them can supply up to 450 milliamps. I have them configured, so they are fixed to 350 milliamps each. Each of these LEDs can get a max of 700 milliamps. And by deciding how much LEDs I put in series, that basically allows me uh, to vary how much power each LED consumes. And that also allows me to control everything with the same voltage, so 24 volts in, and these drivers will regulate it to whatever these LEDs need. So in case I have these six LEDs in series, I will always get the correct forward voltage. And if I only have like one or two there, I will also get the correct forward voltage without having to change my supply voltage. This is like the main point of having a constant current LED driver because they do all these regulations for you to 
always have your LEDs run at the correct values. We get six pieces of those manufactured, each one assembled with a different LED spectrum on here. And this spectrum field is basically for a marking that we print out. So I know which of these modules uses which spectrum. And if I want to uh, alter the current that is going through, I just remove or add LEDs on here. For my first experimentations, I will have them all populated. So I divide the current up through six LEDs. My hope is that the ratio from uh, energy that we have to put into the system that is converted to light is better at lower milliamps. At least that is what I hope from reading the data sheets. So basically they have like an optimal performance point and that is somewhere at the 400 milliamps. So I just hope I get by with less energy. And if I have to make them brighter, and get more energy, I just remove some and connect those pins up and then I basically have altered the circuit. This time we have a second PCB in our project. All the lighting modules have to be controlled somehow and this is now the control circuit also made in KiCad. Okay, so this is the, the board. We have an encoder here that should allow us to scroll through the menu. We have three buttons, one for time, spectrum and start stop basically. These are all directly connected to a microcontroller. On this side, on the back side of the PCB, we have the additional buttons to flash and reset the microcontroller so you don't mix them up with the actual controls. This is the USB port. And here is where the TMC driver will plug in. These little jumper connections here are used to set the different running modes for the motor driver. Now I have left it in default, which is 256 step interpolation and stealth job. So super silent and super smooth. And we have two voltage regulators on here. One that connects to the microcontroller and gives it power when the modules are powered. And the second one is over here. That is just there to have a separate power source, a separate regulation for the TMC driver. So there are no current ripples going through when the TMC driver demands more power. And also uh, this will power the microcontroller when we only plug in USB for programming. So always make sure you can power your device even if the whole unit is not assembled yet. If I look at that in 3D, we can basically see that I'm missing a lot of models, but that is how it will look. Also, don't forget, you need a big cap over here to smooth out the voltage for the stepper motor. And basically everything runs on 24 volts, also the stepper motor. Total, this unit will consume about 4.2 uh, amps. That's quite a lot. Hello, I'm James from Workbench Wednesdays, a show about the stuff found on your electronics workbench. Look for new episodes on, well, Wednesdays. You can connect with me over on the Element 14 community. I look forward to seeing you. For now, it is time to get back to watching this week's project video. Our design is a modular approach. So basically I have the curing parts and I can then modify them by just altering the amount of LEDs. So I can decide if I want to pump all the energy into one LED or divide it up for six LEDs in the hopes to get a more even coverage and basically minimize the heat output versus UV output. So maybe that approach is more energy efficient. That's what this test kit is for, to find that out. And I also got a control panel that allows me to set all the values and basically control the machine. That is a separate PCB. I sent them all off to Isla to get them manufactured. So I get six pieces of the LED segments and three pieces of the controller. One to make it, one to break it, one to give away, basically. Thanks to Isla.net for sponsoring these PCBs. Of course, we can't just run the UV LEDs out in the open. These can be pretty dangerous. So if you directly look into high power UV LEDs, your eyes may get damaged. That's a similar effect to looking into a UV laser. So 
don't ever do it. Always protect your eyes. I've got professional protection glasses, pretty expensive ones, that are tuned to exactly the spectrum I have to deal with. So these protect me from 360 to 410 nanometers. If you get some cheap glasses that are come with like dodgy electronics, uh, be aware that sometimes they are not really UV protection glasses. And also to enclose the thing, we use 20 by 20 extrusions. And by sheer coincidence, I have enough scraps of this to make an enclosure that exactly fits into a kitchen cabinet I already use in my workshop. So we fill out existing space and put it in there. Of course, my device needs a door that should be see-through so I can see what's actually going on inside, but I need to have protection from the UV rays. And did you know, Captain tape is pretty useful for that. You can basically use multiple layers of Captain tape on a PMMA sheet to protect yourself from UV rays at the most basic level. So this is no replacement for real UV protection. So I will always use my glasses when the unit is operated, but it basically avoids all the light leaking out completely unfiltered. So I don't cure stuff that is not intended to be cured or that may be UV uh, sensitive. For the enclosure, I need some mounting parts and I drew them up in FreeCAD. By the way, you can download all the files for this project, the CiCAD files, the SDL files for 3D printing, and also the FreeCAD project files for free on the Element 14 community. So if you want to build your own version, basically you can, or you can use what you find in there and improve on it for your own uh, purposes. Here we have the device mounted in my kitchen cabinet. You can pull it out to get to the electronics, uh, but most importantly, here is the door and it only activates when this dead man switch is closed. So as long as the door is open, this does not get any power for safety. Uh, but even closing the circuit doesn't help us now because there is no code on it. So next portion we have to do the code. Things that occur during coding are, for example, you find bugs or errors that you did in the design. So for me, my main error is I did not estimate the amount of voltage drop enough that occurs over the cables from the microcontroller that only has 3.3 volt logic levels and can maximum sync uh, 20 milliamps of current over like 20 centimeters to the actual device that he's controlling. So we don't have perfect control over them. Sometimes modules start working that are not intended to. So basically we have crosstalk between the lines. Uh, sometimes they are not pulled high or low enough. So there is a lot of improvement to be done on the electronics. And also I wanted to have a rotary encoder to select all the options and the values, but I couldn't get the rotary encoder work properly. And then I found out, oh, I got the wrong type of encoder. Like there are some that are just basically three buttons. One is up, one is down, one is the click wheel in the middle and others can determine the direction that they're uh, turned by having one signal going low before another one. So there's a big difference in coding and how to hook them up. I got the wrong one. Uh, so these are a lot better for constant rotation or for very fast movements. But for my purposes, I should have gotten the other one. So I'm changing the interface to use only uh, the three buttons to set everything. But I also make functions to make sure that if I press one of them again, the unit shuts off, changes that uh, value, and then I can start it again. And for the uh, motor mount, you have already recognized that it's on the top. And that is because I hate having like the soup of dripping IPA stuff at the bottom and maybe that seeps into the device and maybe crusts up the stepper motor and stuff. I really don't like that. So on my unit, all the electronics are above the part. And if something drips, then it just basically goes to the floor or to some uh, container at the bottom and never inside the electronics. So I want to protect them basically. The unit is complete, the code is working, it has some troubles, but the basic functionality is there. And most importantly, the UV LEDs and drivers are working, so I can get to testing it. We set up spectrums and times, try it out in different configurations. I've designed and 3D printed a lot of test parts in wet shape, so I can determine how long it took for a specific thickness to cure. 
We tried it out in this video, but if you want to get the full results of my testings, like the initial results for this one particular resin, then you have to go to the Element 14 community, link is in the description, and there you basically have the write-up of my initial findings to see what actually did react, which spectrum did the curing. My super advanced curing station works thanks to Wirt Electronics new UV LEDs and drivers that basically make it quite easy to get this done and to get the exact spectrum of UV that I really need for my project. If I would do this again, I should think more about crosstalk between the lines, voltage drop and how the encoder actually works before designing it into my design. So there's always improvement to be made. I'm sure you have ideas for those too. So leave them at element 14 on the video page for this project and let's discuss about it. Also, you can download all the files, the code and the results of my testings there. I gotta go. There's another project waiting for me.